to go look at something else. We're going to look at the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. This is a prophecy that is really neat and in this seminar should be particularly significant. Here's why. By looking behind, we will see ahead. We can see ahead. The prophecy in Matthew 24 is actually two prophecies. One is about the destruction of Jerusalem. The other is about the end of the world. And Jesus brings the two together because one is a parallel of the other. Let's see how this unfolds. Matthew 24, verse 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, let me explain something. The disciples, because they were acquainted with the prophecies of Ezekiel and uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah, the, prophecy, the, the, the disciples have plan A in their minds. What do I mean by plan A? That the fulfillment of all that God intended to do was imminently to take place. And it would have been had Israel been faithful. Under plan A, God would have established His kingdom. There's one coming of the Lord, one coming of Jesus. And Jesus would have established His kingdom here on earth at that time had Israel been faithful. Plan A. But because Israel failed, God puts into motion plan B. And the gospel goes to the believers as trustees and the believers are sent to the Gentiles. God abandons Israel, the biological Israel. God abandons. And this is why in Galatians 3, Paul makes it very clear. If you are in Christ, then you are a baby Abraham the offspring of Abraham. And so then you become an heir of all that was promised to your, your father. And Abraham was chosen because of his faith. And so the disciples, they come to Jesus here in this discourse, and they want, they're, they're asking about plan A. When are you going to set up your kingdom? And I like the way it says here in the Bible, they came privately. This was just Jesus and them. Now, Lord, you, you can tell us. What will be the sign of your coming? Coming into your kingdom and bringing your kingdom and of the end of the age. Jesus answered. Now, this is... This is interesting. Watch out. That no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming... I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. In other words, war is no big cookie. I love that expression. I've never heard it before until Joey, Joey House here meant, used it and uh, I thought, man, that is such a neat little expression. I'll use it forever, Joy. Thank you. <laughs> you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. <coughs> birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom 
will be preached in the whole world as a testimony, as a witness, it says in the King James, as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, Jesus has been talking sort of in general terms, and now he's going to get specific. Watch this. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel let the reader understand if he can then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of the house let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. And what is Jesus implying here? When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, what are you supposed to do? As fast as you can. Don't go back and get your coat. When you see the opportunity, when you see this happen, you get out of there. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. Okay, I want to explain a couple of things. I want to explain the abomination that causes desolation. Standing in the holy place. This is the city of Jerusalem. And uh, I, need to, I, I, need to, I need to explain something else first. This popped in my mind. Back in the days when Joshua led the children of Israel over the river Jordan into the promised land, God told Joshua through Moses, I want three cities on this side of the Jordan and three cities on this side of the Jordan to be holy cities set apart from all the other cities and these will be cities of refuge. Cities of refuge. So that if anyone has killed someone, he may run to the city of refuge, and there he can stay in the city until he, his court convenes and a decision is made. I've got to explain this. This is too good. Here's the Sea of Galilee. And here's the Jordan, and here's the Dead Sea. And there's three cities over here, and there's three cities over here. And these cities are set apart, or called holy cities. The word holy means set apart, or sanctified. These are not like the other cities. These aren't like them at all. These are special cities set apart. And so if, let's suppose here that um, two men go out to chop down trees. This guy's got an axe, and this guy's got an axe. And so they go out to chop down this tree, and uh, the axe head comes off of this axe, hits this guy right between the eyes, and so he is dead. And there's the axe head stuck right in the middle of his head. My drawings may not be elaborate, but the scheme here is. So stay with me, please. In God's economy, a life for a life is required. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, bruise for bruise. This is called judicial equilibrium. In common vernacular today, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. That's the idea. God required, if someone killed a person, that person is to be put to death. If it turns out that it was willful, malicious, and intentional. So, let's suppose this guy's name, let's just take, take an ordinary name like Jan, Yeah, and let's just choose another ordinary like name like Jim. 
It's just ironic that they work together. <laughs> really, I'm not implying anything here. I'm just using an illustration. Jim kills Jan. And so Jim, because he knows that the next of kin is the avenger of blood. God has established this. And this is all explained in the book of Numbers, chapter 35, and other places in Leviticus. And so the next of kin becomes the avenger of blood. And the avenger is to kill the murderer guiltlessly. Thus, life for life is satisfied. The judicial equilibrium is kept in balance. So the day that Jim kills Jan, here's Jan, he's laid out. Jim knows that Shelley is after him. And so here goes Jim, running as fast as he can to the city <laughs> of refuge. And he runs to the closest city, and he bangs on the door, and the high priest Excuse me, the priest comes to the, to, the, to the door, or one of the elders comes to the door, and he says, please, please, let me in, I've killed a man. Please, open the door. And the door is swung, the giant door of the city is swung open, and the guilty man, he's guilty of murder. Whether it's accidental or intentional is not an issue at this point. The fact is, he's a guilty man, he knows he killed another man, and his blood is on him. And so he runs into the city, and the elder opens the, door, opens the door and lets him in. Well, Shelley can't go in there. This is called a city of refuge. And as long as Jim is inside the city, he can't be harmed. It's a city of refuge. Well, the elders, they listen to Jim's story. And then they get together um, a number of troops because they're going to escort Jim back to his village. He lives up here, let's say. When they get to the village, they convene a court. And all the elders come and they sit in their, their appointed places. And then the investigation begins to determine if this murder was accidental or intentional. And incidentally, everything I'm telling you, God required it. And the specifications are all laid out in the scripture here. I'm not making this up. This is a mandate from God. So in the, in, the, in the investigation, let's suppose that it comes out to be that uh, Jim had maliciously and had reason and contempt enough to, to kill Jan. And so on the testimony of at least two witnesses, it takes a minimum of two witnesses. Remember, we talked about the two witnesses. It is found that Jim is guilty of first-degree murder, and he's taken outside the city uh, where he lives, and there he's stoned. This is a pile of rocks covering Jim. The person who leads in the stoning is Shelley. She is the avenger of her husband's blood, the next of kin. Everybody with me so far? Now, if it, if it turns out in the course of the trial that uh, Jim, it was an accident, and there are not two witnesses that can condemn Jim, then Jim has to return to the city of refuge where he was first, where he ran first, and Jim has to live there in that city. And his family can come and live with him. And as long as Jim stays in that city, Jim is allowed to live. He has been, he is protected from the, from the condemnation of death as long as he's in that city. If he ventures outside when the ice cream truck goes by, <laughs> <laughs> no, Jim. Shelly's driving the ice cream truck. <laughs> if the minute Jim slips outside the city of refuge, he is fair game. 
Fair game. And Shelley can kill him guiltlessly. Jim must live in the city of refuge until the high priest of Israel dies. And when the high priest of Israel dies, God allows Jim to go free because the, Jim's guilt is transferred to the high priest. And when the high priest dies, we have the satisfaction of life for life. Understand? This is a model of Christ. This is a, this is a, this is a, a parallel of how our salvation works. We are under the wages of sin. We are condemned to death. And we run to the city of refuge, which is Jesus. And as long as we are inside the city, we are safe from the condemnation of sin. Amen? Amen. You slip outside the city, you're dead. That's the way it works. The good news is, our high priest has died. He has paid the penalty for our sins. And as long as we remain in Christ, in the city of refuge, we are safe. That is a wonderful truth. All of these things that God set up in the Old Testament, the wisdom behind them, even though they're no longer applicable today, the wisdom that God used in putting these all together, the puzzles and what they teach and what they offer is incredibly beautiful. And it's all a reflection of Jesus. Jesus engineered all this. This is Jesus we're dealing with in the Old Testament, and this is Jesus that's explaining it in the New. It's wonderful. Well, I told you all about that <laughs> so that I could explain the abomination that causes desolation. Around each of the cities of refuge, there is a border of land. And this land is given to the priests, to the Levites. The Bible gives the dimensions of this land. I don't remember off the top of my head just how many feet there were. Yes? 20, yeah, that number, but is it cubits? Furlongs? I don't remember. the. I know it's, a, it's quite a... If I remember right, it's about a mile and a half. But I don't quote me on that. I don't exactly remember. Can't remember everything. Brain is beginning to <laughs> play out on me. Um, this space all around the city is called the Holy Land. It is set apart for the Levites. Remember, the Levites have no inheritance. God did not give them a section of land. That that tribe did not get a piece of the land when they went into the land of Israel. God forbid the, is the Levites from having an inheritance in land. And here's why. This is so neat. God required Israel to return a tithe. And the way this works is like this. If the priests did their job in teaching the people to live by faith, in encouraging the people to, to follow the, after the Lord, the tithe would never end. And the Levites would never need the land. Very, very elegant solution. The Lord didn't want the preachers consumed with the earthly matters. And he prevented them from owning the land. But you know the story of Israel. And the root of Israel's problems lie with its priesthood, its preachers. That's what ruined Israel. That's why God gave them no inheritance, because their inheritance was based upon their doing His will, and if they did His will, Israel would prosper, and the people would grow, and their understanding of God, and their love for God, and their adoration for God. And there would be transformed lives and there would be an ever-increasing Israel. But the priesthood went south and the nation followed. That's the way it works. This land around the city of each city of refuge is called the Holy Land. The land set apart. And it was used by the priests to grow small gardens. 
How many cities of refuge did I mention? When David conquered the city of Jebus, this became the seventh holy city. And David changed the name of Jebus to Jerusalem, the seventh holy city. And the land around Jerusalem was the holy land that belonged to the Levites. Now, Matthew, when he writes the gospel in 24, Matthew is a Jew. And he would use language that Jews would understand. And the Jews clearly understood the abomination that causes desolation. Let me explain from the Jewish perspective what this means. An abomination is an act of offense to God. If you say, oh, that is an abomination, what do you mean, Margie? Blasphemy. Awful. Terrible. Abomination. It's about the biggest, meanest word we can think of to describe that. That's abomination. To, to have an uncircumcised Gentile come stand in the Holy Land was considered an abomination. If that Gentile is, ba is intent on the destruction of the city, that would be an abomination that causes desolation. What is desolation? Destruction. Fortunately, I'll prove the point now, uh, at this same little me hillside meeting, when the disciples all came to talk to Jesus, Luke is there. And he hears Jesus give the same words. But Luke is not a Jew. He's a Gentile. And so when he writes what he heard, notice how he describes the same thing. Let's go to Luke chapter 21. Let me back up here. I won't read. You can read Luke 21 later at your convenience. I'm just trying to get to the meat of the message so that you won't go to sleep on me. Luke 21, 16. And you'll notice the same thing was said in Matthew. You will be betrayed even by your parents, brothers, and relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And all men will hate you because of me but not a hair of your head will perish. That doesn't mean you won't die. That just means that you won't perish. There's a difference in the way God sees things. To die is no big deal. To perish is forever. By standing firm, you will gain life. Now notice how Luke, hearing the same words, writes it as a Gentile would hear it. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out. And let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. So forth. So you, you get the... The, the, the writing of Luke and the writing of Matthew, and you put them together and you understand exactly what Jesus is saying. And let me tell you historically now how it happened. This is really slick, really neat. In A.D. 68, Titus, the Roman general, set siege to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a city that the Romans hated intensely. The Jews were in constant rebellion with the Romans. The conflict between them was just at a white hot, it was an ethnic issue. It's like all ethnic issues. There is no resolution. What happened in Bosnia? What's happening in the Middle East? 
There's no resolution to ethnic issues. In the Christian heart, there's resolution because there's love. There's love. But in our world, in the carnal heart, there is no resolution. God's patience, and Felix brought this up during the intermission. I meant I should have indicated this, but God's patience with Israel did not end when they killed his son. He still waited another three years. Waiting until their cup would fill up. And in the, seven, in, in, and in the sabbatical year, A.D. 33, which is this 70th week, you know, the last year of the 70th week, the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of Israel, condemned Stephen to death and stoned him for his testimony on behalf of Christ. That sealed up the fate of Israel and God abandoned the, the nation of Israel. But God did not destroy Jerusalem the following year. God had a need to keep Jerusalem intact for about another 37 years to allow Christianity whose cradle was also Jerusalem, to get established. And the great conference in Acts 15, A.D. 49, and a host of things, important developments occurred. And what this prophecy is all about that Jesus gave to his disciples is all about the Christians understanding the destruction, the coming destruction of Jerusalem. And if you'll notice what Luke says, let's go to the computer, verse 22, He's talking about the destruction of the city for this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. You might say, did God predict the destruction of Jerusalem? Absolutely. Where does he do that? Let's go back to Daniel 9 verse 24. You remember in the 70 weeks prophecy, 70 weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city. Jerusalem, the seventh holy city, city of refuge, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin and atone for wickedness. And then he goes on in the next verse, know and understand from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, there will be a certain amount of time and it will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. And then after the 62 weeks, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing now watch this sentence. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. That which was predicted to be rebuilt was also predicted to be destroyed. In A.D. 68, Titus sent his troops against Jerusalem and the Roman army set siege. These are soldiers standing around the city. This is how they did it in ancient times. And they might set siege and they might sit there for a year and a half. Starving the people to death. Cutting off their water, cutting off their food, letting them eat their children inside. That's how they did this. And so the Romans came. The destroyer is sent to destroy. For those of you, you remember why God sends a destroyer? Why? Because the nation that is to be destroyed has filled up its cup. Right? And so the Romans are standing around the city. They've set siege. They're in the Holy Land, this radius of land around the city. And then Caesar dies. The troops pull back because there's a change of leadership in Rome. The Christians in Jerusalem understand exactly what has happened. The abomination that causes desolation, when you see it surrounded, when you get the opportunity, don't even go back and get your coat. Flee. Well, Caesar dies. Uh, Titus withdraws. 
Vespasian comes back a few weeks later, sets siege, and destroys Jerusalem, plows it under, burns the temple, all the gold and the rocks of the temple melts, runs down between the stones, and the Romans pull the stones apart to get the gold. And the prophecy of Jesus that not one stone would be left upon another is fulfilled. But the beauty of this whole thing is not one Christian perished. According to the historical record, when the troops withdrew to go back to Rome to take care of the change of the guard, the Christians escaped. They knew what was coming. And, the, and Christianity then spread throughout the land, throughout the world, and Jerusalem was plowed under. And then in the 8th century, this is the, this is the first century, in the 8th century, to prevent the Jews from ever rebuilding the temple, God moved upon the Muslims to put their temple, the Dome of the Rock, on the Temple Mount so that the temple in Jerusalem could never be rebuilt. It will never be rebuilt. God has decreed it. And He has put in the place, if you want to ignite the whole world, bomb the Dome of the Rock. <laughs> the world will go up. Um, and the Jews, because they can't build their temple, they can't restore their services because God forbid them from ever conducting their services at any other place than the place where He had chosen. You see, the Temple Mount is not just an ordinary place. God doesn't do things, everything He does is deliberate and intentional. Let me sh explain something. When God called Abraham to kill Isaac, remember the test of faith? And He had him to go up on Mount Moriah and to build an altar? The place where that altar was located is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Same spot. Years later, when Jacob is fleeing for his life as he's running from Esau, and he lies down with a rock under his head for a pillow, and he sees the ladder reaching from heaven to earth, that ladder touched earth, that ladder came to earth, on the same spot where the altar to slay Isaac had been created. This spot of ground is important to God. Years later, when it came time to buy land for the building of the temple, King David went and purchased Onan's threshing floor. You remember that? God led him to Onan. Onan wanted to give the land. And he said, no, I'm going to buy this land and pay for it. And this is the same land where Abraham offered up Isaac. The temple was built there on that piece of ground. And God in the Old Testament tells them very clearly, when you get to the land I'm giving you, and I point out the place where the offerings and the sacrifices are to be held, I want them done there and nowhere else. When Israel was destroyed in A.D. 70 and the nation wiped out, then God put the Muslim mosque on there. The Jewish economy is bankrupt for the rest of eternity. It will never be rebuilt. There's not enough time. <laughs> and, and what's amazing is that Christians have bought into a whole prophetic schematic that's all looking to Israel when you ought to be looking up to the heavens. Amen. Our salvation is coming from here. And prophecy is not keyed on the behavior of Israel. This is a whole, this, is, this whole thing is taking the world prophetically into a schematic and into a scheme that is totally false in my view. And the end result is that you have a world of Christians looking for something that will never happen. There will be no rapture. There will be a great rupture. The understanding of prophecy, though, doesn't save us. Jesus saves. This afternoon, I'm going to be talking about faith. What faith in God is all about. 
We're about to enter a time period when our faith in God is going to be severely tested. And this is why Jesus invites us to learn now to live by faith. To learn now to see that God is there. To take those steps and follow Him so that our faith and trust in His providing, in His care, so that you can actually know for yourself, God knows me and cares for me. When you see God do things for you that you know He did for you, it changes everything. Isn't that the truth? When you have been through an experience that is hard and frustrating and, 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 and you don't know how, what to do, but you put your confidence in following God, Sometimes our honesty is questioned. Sometimes our sanity is questioned. Sometimes our integrity is questioned. But I'll tell you this. When you stand for what is right, though the heavens fall, when you stand to honor the Lord in all that you do, in all that you say, God will honor you. If you honor Him, He will honor you. His disciples went to their deaths. But the honor that He's promised is still coming. They're going to be wearing crowns that will be so full of stars we'll have to go around and help them. <laughs> you see, God doesn't see death as the end. But this life is where we show our love and our obedience to the Lord. I want to close on this text. In John chapter... Just a minute here. I wanted to... Well, I must have misplaced it. There's two texts, sorry. Let's look at this text first. Jesus was in an argument with the Pharisees and He said, listen... He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Whoa. Whoa. That's pretty strong stuff. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. When you love Jesus and you give your life to Him, when I say give, I mean give. You become willing to go and to be and to do all that He directs. That's when we begin to live by faith. That's when we begin to grow up in faith. And that's when we begin to mature into a character like that of Christ. I invite you this morning 
to give your life to Jesus. Again. Every day. Renew that commitment. Lord, I want to be willing to go and to be and to do all that you require. I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Let's stand for the benediction.